secure in a relationship, we tend to do the things toward the other person, we reference to the other person, to hopefully gain a sense of security from them, and if you never get it, you never feel secure in the relationship. How do we ever know that we've done enough good works to get us to heaven? How do you ever know? How would you ever measure that? So therefore, you have to live each day of your faith out of the fear that maybe you haven't done enough. And it creates profound insecurity in our relationship with God. And then fourthly, it diminishes the perfect work of Christ by implying that Jesus' death was not sufficient for the salvation of sinners. The work of Christ was perfect. God requires a perfect sacrifice. It's only the perfect sacrifice of Christ that can be offered that will open the heart of God in His favor to us as sinners. And the only perfect offering available to us is nothing we can offer. The Bible says all of our good works or righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But the perfect work of Christ is something that is a seamless garment of perfection that pleased as a fragrant aroma in the sight of God, our Heavenly Father, and it's the favor that Jesus merited for us that's now imputed to us by faith. Okay. A couple more verses I want to uh, mention. Matthew 25, verse 31. A story about the judgment at the end of the world. How does Jesus separate the sheep from the goats? Is it by faith? No, it's by what they've done. You're all probably very familiar with this, about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and the imprisoned. For what they have done, they are rewarded eternal life. For what the goats haven't done, doing all those things, they are rewarded with eternal punishment, with eternal hellfire. Faith here, obviously, is assumed it's because you can't leave faith out of that equation. Luke 9.23 says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross one time, one act of faith. No. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Where is Jesus? In heaven. So if we want to follow him, what do we have to do? We have to, number one, deny ourselves. Something we do. It's a work. We do. A daily work, as, as all of you know. And number two, we have to take up our cross daily. A whole lot of works. Day by day, there's something we have to do. We have to pick up our cross. We have to deny ourselves. Nowhere does this passage imply salvation by faith alone. First, we have to deny ourselves. Again, a work. Then we have to pick up our crosses daily. This is not faith alone. This is faith and works, just as the church teaches. Dr. Saxon says that faith and works dilutes the sacrifice of Christ. That's his opinion. I disagree very vociferously with that opinion. I don't know how it dilutes the sacrifice of Christ when it is only because of the sacrifice of Christ that we can have the responses to God's grace that we have. A response of faith. He said faith is a response. Well, that's what works are. They are a response to God's gift, free gift of his grace that was merited by Jesus Christ on the cross and through which we can attach ourselves to Jesus' works, to Jesus' sufferings by God's grace through faith and works. He said people sometimes get messed up by trying to live by faith and works. Well, any good thing can be abused. I know people who get messed up by living by faith alone. I, had a, there's, I won't mention the church or the denomination, but uh, a deacon at a church in, in uh, Birmingham cheated on his wife, divorced her, remarried his wife. The wife who was cheated on and divorced went to the pastor of that church and said, your deacon cheated on me, committed adultery and did this and that and, and remarried and you're not supposed to be divorced and remarried. He doesn't need to be a deacon in his church anymore. And the pastor told her, well, it doesn't affect his salvation. He's saved by faith alone. That's not right. He said it removes security, produces fear and insecurity by trying to, you know, how much do I have to do to please God? Well, we have to give it all to please God. All of it. Jesus says, you know, the servant out in the field, what's he going to do? He works all day long, he comes in, does he expect the master to sit down, have him sit down at table and the master waits on him? No. 
He says the servant has to wait on the master, even though he's worked in the field all day long and he's bone tired. He said, faithless, worthless servant, all you've done is what you've been required to do. We have to give it all to Jesus, all the time. There's no fear. I, since I came back into the Catholic faith, I have more security than I ever have. More surety, more certainty about my faith and my relationship with Christ than I ever had when I was outside of the church. And then he said it diminishes the perfect work of Christ. Again, that's his opinion. But if we go back to the passages I've talked about, Jesus says, we are the branches, he is the vine. To be part of the vine, you have to believe, you have to have faith, you have to be part of the body of Christ through faith, in, according to Dr. Saxon's theology. So they have the faith, but then they don't produce the works, some of the branches. What happens? Are they still saved? No. They are cut off, allowed to wither and die, and thrown into the fire to be burned. In my concluding remarks, what I'd like to do is share uh, with you just a word of testimony. I grew up for the first 15 to 20 years of my life within the faith plus works viewpoint. Then from age 20 to my current age of 54, I've lived within the faith alone viewpoint, and I would like to contrast my experience for you in conclusion. I grew up a devoted Catholic son of a devout Catholic mother. I was in church every time the doors opened and followed strictly the teachings of the Catholic Church to a letter. I attended Mass and took communion daily in the local parochial school with my siblings and then was instructed in the hour-long religion classes each morning. As soon as I reached the appropriate age, I was approved to participate in the sacrament of penance Holy Communion, and Confirmation. I became an altar boy as soon as I was eligible to serve and was privileged to serve the Memorial Mass in honor of President Kennedy the Saturday evening after he was tragically assassinated in November of 1963. I was a firm believer in the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith that Jesus was the Son of God and God the Son. He came and died a redemptive death to remove our sins and to grant us forgiveness. I aspired to become a priest and dreamed of being the first American Pope. However, I also believed, as I had been taught, that I needed to strictly comply with the rules and regulations of my religious upbringing and do my part of the equation to meet Jesus halfway. I abstained from eating meat on Fridays, attended Mass as many as ten times a week, faithfully went to communion and confession just as I'd been instructed. I was fastidious in my obedience to everything I had been taught, and I could be described as a young man who was zealous for his faith. Then in my mid-teens, I moved away from it all for some mysterious reason. My heart just wasn't in it anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. My relationship with God grew distant and irrelevant to my daily life, and I stopped trying to be a good guy and just went out and did my own thing. I just gave up on pleasing God and exited the spiritual performance treadmill that I was on through the theology of faith plus works equals salvation. After five years of a riotous lifestyle, I, I re-entered the race of personal spirituality, but this time under different terms. This time I was told that to become a Christian, all that I needed to do was to accept Jesus' redemptive work as totally sufficient for my salvation. He paid it all, and his death alone was not only necessary, but was sufficient for my salvation. I prayed a simple prayer of faith, surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and jump-started my spiritual journey again. Only this time, it has been very different. Much different than the first go-round. I was not under pressure to perform on a certain spiritual level of perfection. I saw God's love in a new and unconditional light. I didn't do anything to earn it and couldn't do anything to lose it. The idea of obedience immediately took on a radically different meaning to me. I wasn't trying to earn brownie points with my Heavenly Father. I wasn't trying to be the perfect person that I wasn't and that He requires if we're going to be saved by faith plus good works. I was able to relax and be myself and be relieved that Jesus had taken on the total punishment for all my shortcomings. I was now free to enjoy a secure relationship with God and all my sphere of spiritual failure had been lifted from my shoulders. I began to run the race of faith with a new vigor and enthusiasm. My admiration for Jesus and what he had done for me skyrocketed. He, not me, was the perfect person who died a perfect death for my sins. He gave me a perfect sense of forgiveness. 
He offered me a perfect love with no conditions and promised me a home in heaven, a perfect place, where I would be made perfect.